My name is Lynn Weiner. I'm the co-chair of the AHA Committee on Non-Tenure Track Faculty, um, along with uh, Phil Suchma and our committee. And what we're going to do today is talk about a survey and report that we have completed over the last year on non-tenure track teaching. Uh, the report, which is here, was accepted by the AHA Council on Thursday and will be soon up on the website. So we're very excited about it. We want to talk about it. And then actually, we want your ideas and your thoughts about what the AHA could and should do uh, about this issue that maybe we haven't thought of. And so we're very much looking forward to your ideas. Uh, so a report is, I, do I need to use a mic? Am I OK with you guys? OK. So um, uh, a report was accepted by the AHA Council. And what we do is we say, what do we know about contingent part-time and full-time faculty? What can the AHA do? Uh, to recommend to departments and universities to improve working conditions. Uh, so these are the questions we're going to raise, and then we're going to ask for your suggestions. So first, uh, the introductions of our panel. Between uh, the five of us, we have over 50 years of adjunct teaching experience. All of us began, uh, or continue, either one, our careers as adjunct teachers. I'll begin uh, alphabetically with uh, Monique Laney. Over okay. here, uh, she, from uh, 2011 to 2014, was a visitor or lecturer at American University, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the Ruhr University in Germany. She is now an assistant professor of history at Auburn University uh, in Alabama, has a PhD from the University of Kansas in American Studies, and a bachelor's and master's degrees from uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt. Her work focuses on migrants with special skills. And her book was just recently published by Yale. It's called German Rocketeers and the Heart of Dixie, Making Sense of the Nazi Past During the Civil Rights Era, uh, which is a study of German scientists in post-war Alabama. Charlene Sea, at the end, is a teacher and administrator, a director of program review and assessment at California State University in Long Beach. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, PhD from the University of California, Irvine, is the co-author of a book called History and Theory, and does research on 18th century women and work in Britain. Phil Suchma, the co-chair of this committee, uh, is currently an adjunct. Since 2006, when he graduated, he's been teaching at Lehman College, St. John's University, and Fordham all in New York. He really is the classic Rhodes Scholar who goes from university to university teaching. He earned his bachelor's at St. Louis University, MA and PhD at Ohio State, and his area of research is sports history, and he's uh, published on the Cleveland Indians, sports stadiums, and Bob Feller, who I feel I should know who that is, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and just bear with me one second. I've lost my last sheet here. And so I'm going to ask uh, Charlie Zappia. Oh, here he is, the dean. The dean of the School of Behavioral, Social and Behavioral Science and Multicultural Studies at, and Emeritus Professor of History at San Diego Mesa College, a community college of about 31,000. He has a PhD from Berkeley. MA from San Jose State, and a BA from Pittsburgh. Charlie has published on higher education and on the history of labor, race, and ethnicity. And from 1976 to 1985, he was an adjunct at five different colleges. Finally, there's me, Lynn Weiner. I'm the university historian at Roosevelt University, uh, which is a career that uh, the university gave me after 12 years as the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I was also a history professor there. Uh, Roosevelt is a, a master's comprehensive in Chicago. Um, I have my uh, graduate degrees from Boston University in American Studies and a BA from the University of Michigan. And I write on women's history, labor history, and popular culture and education. But I was an adjunct for a long time, too. From 1981 to 93, I was an adjunct at various universities in the Chicago area, 
including Roosevelt, where I eventually got a job. And I also, in a, in a pinch, I, I wound up writing Encyclopedia Britannica articles for 10 cents a word. Um, so when you're an adjunct and you're trying to make a living, you wind up doing many things. So now uh, what we're going to do is have each person talk about the section of our uh, survey that they're uh, most familiar with. And as you know, the landscape of higher education is changing rapidly as non-tenure track professors are increasing everywhere. One thing we found, though, is that a lot of them are on multi-year contracts as full-time or half-time uh, positions. Professional associations, including the AHA, uh, have done report after report after report on the nature of adjunct teaching. Even at this meeting, the Coordinating Council of, for Women in History had a session uh, on uh, adjuncts as a survey, uh, after a survey of their own membership. So now we'll begin uh, with our survey, and we'll ask um, Charlene and Monique to talk about uh, faculty. OK. I guess I'm starting. <laughs> I thought I'd stand a little bit. Oh, and the mic is on, so just a second. Sorry, I didn't realize I was going up first. Come on. My apologies. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my job really today is to actually give a summary of the report that Charlene and I put together, which was um, based on the survey responses from non-tenure track faculty only. We have other sections of the survey that uh, others will be talking about. Um, but before I do this, I just wanted to note that uh, when I was asked to join the committee, I was still cobbling together teaching gigs myself and other forms of income, um, so that many of these survey responses resonate very deeply with me, as maybe with many of you as well. Um, and to be honest, I was initially not thrilled by the idea of a committee that investigates the impact so-called contingent faculty on the teaching of history because I didn't think that findings to improve um, the teaching of history by non-tenure track faculty would benefit non-tenure track faculty, but rather potentially make it more difficult to actually affect change. So I have some mixed feelings about all of this still, as maybe some others here do as well. Uh, but I also thought it would be better to be part of the conversation than not. Um, on to the report, uh, Charlene and I decided to focus primarily on the comment sections associated with the survey questions, and particularly the last question that asked for additional comments. Um, and I wonder, is anybody in here who actually partook in the survey? No, okay. Um, since most of the issues are interrelated, we divided them up in recurring themes. Um, one theme was income, another one was the issue of course assignments, Another one is how a non-tenure track faculty feels treated by the institutions they work for, um, how they feel treated by tenure track faculty. And finally, the main question our committee was charged with, the impact of using non-tenure track faculty on the teaching of history. Much of what we found will not be news to many of you, but we hope that a review will help stimulate the conversation afterwards. There are two general takeaways I want to point out first. One is that the diversity of types of non-tenure track faculty and the diversity of experiences make it quite difficult to make any generalizations. The other part is that many of our respondents described how their status affects them emotionally. And accordingly, being treated as a second-class citizen and not as a professional, having spent a lot of time and money on a degree that does not appear to be valued and not having a voice in the department, all create a sense of alienation and marginalization frustration, morale drain, stress, doubt in oneself as a quote unquote real scholar, despite having the qualifications, discouragement and isolation. Under the uh, rubric of income, we summarized this. Um, unsur unsurprisingly, respondents were concerned about the lack of economic stability. Many noted that they would be unable to continue in their positions without either second or even third jobs or a partner with a full-time job. Very few respondents noted that economic insecurity negatively impacted their teaching, however. Those who did state that their teaching was impacted referenced traveling to other jobs, taking care of children because they could not afford full-time daycare, and taking other positions as affecting preparation time. As one person wrote, 
Quote, the low pay requires me to hold two other non-teaching jobs in order to make a still meager living, and the time I must spend working and commuting to those has a hugely negative impact on my ability to update my courses, my ability to do any research, and my ability to devote time and individualized attention to my students. I do the best I can, but I know if it wasn't for the two other jobs I must hold, I could do so much better. Still others note that their positions are becoming unstable, stating that health benefits have been taken away, classes have been reassigned, and there is now no guarantee of employment beyond the current term. It should be noted that many respondents said that their position does provide economic security with health benefits. These respondents also pointed out that they taught at institutions with strong faculty unions or at small liberal arts colleges. But even those faculty who are in fairly stable positions Note the big discrepancy in remuneration for the same work. One said, I have been very fortunate to be in a congenial department and a university with much support for research. Also, I have enjoyed a half-time position with full benefits and security for the last 25 years. I teach more than my tenure-track colleagues and get paid half, and that is what it is. Some specifically refer to salary not matching the cost of living for the area. Quote, pay is criminally low relative to cost of living, and when they charge for parking, it's an additional small slap in the face. In other words, even non-tenure track faculty who teach full time are not being compensated adequately relative to their training skills or to the cost of living in the region. Combined together, the poor salary has had serious economic, social, and psychological effects on the non-tenure track population. The other um, theme that we used was uh, course assignments. So one of the most consistent issues non-tenure track faculty face is lack of advance notice to prepare for a course. Consequently, non-tenure track faculty believe that their course, courses are not as well developed as they could be because sometimes they are given a week or even just a weekend to prepare an entire course. Administration's inability to promise courses without risk of the offer being rescinded directly contributes to the negative psychological aspects of being a non-tenure track faculty. Further, respondents noted that the lack of solid pay combined with the need to find as many courses as possible to make ends meet means that non-tenure track faculty see each other as competition. As a result, there is little to no incentive to develop collaborative projects. In addition, they may find classes canceled at the last minute because of low enrollment, even though many grant-dependent students regularly re register at the last minute. Non-tenure track faculty often find themselves with litter, little to no choice about teaching assignments and are frequently not allowed to develop their own curriculum. Some faculty are not even teaching in their field, others not even in their discipline. Some additional important comments included that even the non-tenure track faculty market is highly competitive with graduate students constantly joining the pool of job seekers. Also, in addition to trying to balance time for teaching and research, non-tenure track faculty often have multiple other time-consuming tasks to perform, including constant job searching, which is seen as a full-time job in itself, and traveling between institutions to cobble together enough courses. Several respondents noted that their job conditions vary greatly between institutions, which means that one person can have several different experiences. One respondent noted that having to adjust to different logistics at different institutions, that is library systems, learning management systems, etc., which is often punctuated by constant changes in these logistics, takes up time as well. Another interesting point made was that an NTTS, I'm sorry, non-tenure track faculty's unusual schedule means that they have to rely on a car instead of being able to take advantage of public transportation or carpooling, which I assume has lots of other implications as well. Um, one other section was that we uh, categorized was treatment by institution, so how uh, non-tenure track faculty is being treated by the institutions they're working for. And so according to the responses, the majority are not included in departmental meetings or curriculum development. One commentator noted that there is no incentive to get involved in the workings of the department, while another noted that this also meant that he or she had more time for research and teaching. Yet a few lamented the fact that they had no vote in faculty meetings or that they could not participate in committee work and governance and that they are left off decisions such as hiring and program design. 
One commentator stated that non-tenure track faculty do have representatives in department meetings, but they, they are not paid for their time. Another noted that the limits put on how long non-tenure track faculty can be hired for means that their voices are not represented at the administrative level. The general tenor is that department chairs and school administrators usually treat non-tenure track faculty as second class citizens. One respondent noted that non-tenure track faculty are only called on when the department needs help. In another case, the department chair did not inform faculty and students of the fact that the non-tenure track faculty member is teaching full time for the department. Another noted that he or she is unclear about what is expected of him or her as a non-tenure track faculty. And yet another reported that teaching at a satellite campus results in the larger institution not caring about them except as revenue generator. And I think you get a sense of all the different kinds of people who are, you know, job situations we're talking about. In addition to the low salary, contracts that last only one semester mean that non-tenure track faculty is unable to plan his or her future any further than one semester at a time. In one case, the non-tenure track faculty's contract renewal depends on lengthy applications and class visits from faculty who are not familiar with the heavy teaching load. Another commentator reported that the university he or she works at has a policy to never hire lecturers full time, and yet another reported that the university excludes non-tenure track fa faculty from applying for administrative positions altogether. Some offered comparisons with the treatment of tenure track faculty in the same department as evidence of non-tenure track faculty second class status. Accordingly, some non-tenure track faculty receive one or all of the following. No course releases for teaching lower division survey courses, no time off from teaching, are asked to fill the gaps in course schedules, which leads to crazy schedules and larger classes. They are paid much less with no benefits while teaching the same types of courses as tenure track faculty. They get no institutional support for research trips and or conferences. They're excluded from university-wide research initiatives. They receive no recognition from their departments, institutions for their research accomplishments. They are, oops, sorry. That just went too fast. Just a second. Um, they are presumably not being paid for research, even though many tenured uh, faculty are not actively engaged in research either. So that comparison is problematic. In one case, the administration actively discouraged non-tenure track faculty from doing research if they were looking for non-tenure track promotions, which in turn means that non-tenure track fac faculty are unable to participate in advising graduate students. Now on to treatment by tenure track faculty. The reports on how tenure track faculty treat non-tenure track faculty were quite mixed. Some feel well respected and valued by their colleagues, by their tenure track fac faculty colleagues, where one person reported that he or she is fully integrated into the department, but others describe the situation as a caste system and tenure track faculty as arrogant and disrespectful towards ten non-tenure track faculty. One of the main problems is that there is little interaction between non-tenure track and tenure track faculty, which sometimes means that the tenure track faculty are unaware of their non-tenure track faculty colleagues. Those who report being disrespected by tenure track faculty provided the following examples. Tenure track faculty do not know non-tenure track faculty's name, title, or the reasons he or she is there. Others reported cultural assumptions about the superiority of tenure track faculty, which produces tension in curriculum development and discussions and programming. Disrespect is evidenced in titles on departmental correspondence, faculty mailboxes, and even promotional materials for guest lectures that are presented by non-tenure track faculty. Lack of honest vocabulary for tenure track faculty to truly discuss things with the non-tenure track faculty was also mentioned and a lack of academic collegiality. Now others re reported being treated friendly and respectfully, yet not being seen as colleagues and having no one to share their research, teaching experience, strategies, or course ideas with. Now to um, the main focus, I would say, what we were charged with initially is to look at the impact on students and the teaching of history. Um, several commentators noted that both teaching and research are affected by their status, yet most respondents stated that their status has no negative impact on their teaching. Those respondents who stated that it did impede their teaching provided the following reasons. 
Uh, one is that they are overworked and therefore have difficulty modifying their curriculum to improve teaching. Another one is that though they would like to redesign courses, the instability of course offerings uh, term to term means that they sometimes have limited time to submit a syllabus and with no guarantee of teaching the same class do not proactively revise course material. Respondents felt that they did not have adequate opportunities to develop as instructors, consistently referencing a lack of interaction with students. This lack of interaction stems from a number of factors, including um, that they are often not allowed to participate in advising, and so do not get to know the students in their major. They often have too many students, which means that they spend less time interacting with their students' work, writing comments, and meeting with them. Several commentators pointed out that they were expected to develop a course, grade final exams, invest time in teaching improvement, hold office hours, write recommendation letters, and continuously take on more students without being compensated for this additional work. As one commentator put it succinctly, this in effect means that non-tenure track faculty are donating their time to the institution. Another common complaint was the lack of appropriate office space for non-tenure track faculty or its inconvenient location on campus, often far away from main campus activities. The main concern here was the need for a space to deal with student behavioral issues for which a shared small office space is not adequate either. Several commentators stated that they lack access to certain tangibles taken for granted by tenure track faculty, such as supplies, a mailbox, a copier and printer, um, or even have to contend with outdated or only semi-functional computer equipment. Some institutions seem to restrict what level student non-tenure track faculty are allowed to teach so that they are not allowed to teach honor classes or students beyond their second year, for example. Some were only allowed to teach general education classes and others noted that they were not permitted to be on master's or PhD committees. Another area of criticism was the lack of support for teaching improvement. Some noted that they received none or little feedback on their teaching, that they did not have access to the training tenure track faculty received, or that they were only permitted to take a skill development course if it was not filled by tenure track faculty. As one person noted, non-tenure track faculty are expected to teach a broader spectrum of courses with less notice than tenure track faculty, yet with little course development resources. Okay. All right. Um, here are some recommendations for departments that we came up with, and uh, we hope that you might help us add to that. The overall tenor of the survey responses is that short of paying non-tenure track faculty appropriately for the work they perform, tenure track faculty, department chairs, and university administration could greatly improve the strained situation that most respondents seem to experience by creating a more inclusive environment in which non-tenure track faculty feel appreciated and valued as colleagues and major contributors to the university's and department's educational goals. This includes recognition of non-tenure track faculty accomplishments in teaching and research, inclusion and in decision making that affects non-tenure track faculty teaching, inclusion in departmental university celebrations, and offering the same opportunities to improve professionally that are offered to tenure track faculty. In addition to adequate wages, it also seems that at a minimum, non-tenure track faculty need office space, supplies, well-functioning equipment, and mailboxes. Departments might also want to think of ways that they can foster collaboration between tenure track faculty and non-tenure track faculty to help close the divide that seems to exist in many departments and that appears to nurture dissatisfaction and probably also misunderstandings. Some of the respondents made suggestions as well, and I'll just note them real quick, um, that university administrations improve their awareness of the needs and concerns of non-tenure track faculty, that they acknowledge the work of non-tenure track faculty with awards and similar accolades, include small tokens of appreciation, such as offering reduced tickets for student performances, invite non-tenure track faculty to, part to department and university-wide social and academic events, and provide funds to bring in guest speakers. One respondent noted how important it is the, cha the chair's approach is, that it makes a big difference if the chair thinks inclusively and invites non-tenure track faculty to participate in meetings and, and decision making. That was my part. So. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we're going to ask uh, Charlene okay. to speak. But before you do, let me just, I'd like to just add a couple of quick things. 
Uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012 found that 28% of teachers of history are off the tenure track. So those, I think, are the most recent figures that we've seen. And of this 28%, three out of four are part-time. Our survey, uh, just so you know as we continue to talk, heard back from 600 adjunct faculty, from 172 department chairs, and from 500 students. So that's the, the pool that resulted in the discussions that we're having this afternoon. Shalene will not go. Um, I was going to sit, but I think I'm going to stand. I feel good to be standing, um, so I'll go up there. So uh, Monique was charged in this section to talk about the part of the report that we co-wrote. And so she gave you all of our findings. I was asked to, and I have a little bit of feedback here, um, I was asked to, I think there's something with me with feedback. <laughs> Should I stop and tell? Okay. Um, to give you my personal story, uh, as uh, Lynn uh, mentioned in uh, her introduction, I am the Director of Program Review and Assessment uh, on my campus, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my trajectory in getting there and uh, the ways in which my position now is reflective of some of the recommendations that we're putting forth. So when I was asked in 2013 to serve on the committee, I was asked to serve specifically because of my expertise as an assessment coordinator and the unique trajectory that I had as a, a non-tenure track faculty member. And I will also like to say up front that um, I may say the word lecturer, and so for the purposes of my Part, portion of the talk. When I say lecturer, just equated it to non-tenure track faculty member because that is how we refer to all instructors who are not on the tenure track at my university and old habits really die hard. Uh, so um, in, uh, I've been a lecturer since 1998 at Cal State Long Beach. I kind of fell into that position. They had a need for a Western Civ instructor and I thought, what the heck, I've taught Western Civ. So I went in and got the position and they liked, they liked what I did and they hired me back for another class the next semester. The next year I got two classes. The next semester I got three classes and then it increased up until I had a, a 15 unit load or five classes per semester. Uh, and I would point out that the, the, one of the reasons that I was there um, and remained there um, and had the opportunities that I did was because of the chair who hired me and her successor. Um, for example, um, I was walking in maybe three years after I was hired to go check my mailbox and the chair said to me, Charlene, would you like to teach history and theory, which is one of our three core classes? And I said, would I? Absolutely, because that's one of my fields. And so being given these opportunities um, by the chair and being recognized by the chair for my particular expertise was incredibly important in my particular trajectory. Um, and uh, I was also recognized by other faculty members. Uh, I would walk down the hall and somebody would say, oh, you have an interest in Middle Eastern history. Would you like to serve on the Middle East, uh, Middle East Near East Subcommittee of the International Education Committee? And I said, sure. Right, so I took advantage of all these opportunities, but again, it was in recognition of the fact that people saw me as an individual who had um, things to give to the department. And again, that's some of the things that Monique were, was talking about earlier. Uh, in uh, 2004, I became the uh, coordinator of our core curriculum program in our department, which oversees the three core classes that all history majors have to take. Um, and, uh, uh, and I remained in that position for longer than I should have, because when I became director of assessment, I, it was very difficult to navigate those two positions. Um, needless to say, I no longer serve in that position now. Uh, so I, I took opportunities where I could to engage in the department, to engage in, in, in university uh, opportunities. For example, I was um, uh, approached to serve on our, our writing assessment requirement committee because of the work that I did in the department as the coordinator of our core curriculum. So university opportunities um, uh, appeared as a consequence of opportunities that I had at the department level. 
Uh, and then I moved, uh, branched out a little bit further and started working with organizations such as uh, the World History Association. And in 2008, I received the World History Association Teaching Prize. And then the next year, I kind of piggybacked on that and I applied for, uh, or I was actually nominated, and then I received the Distinguished Faculty Teaching Award for, for that year. And when I received that award, I was approached um, uh, by the vice provost to apply for the position I currently hold. So I applied for the position and I received that position. Again, it's Director of Program Review and Assessment. So now I have an 80% buyout. Uh, it's, a, it's not a full administrative, what we would call in California an MPP position. It is a faculty buyout, but it's 80% administration and 20% teaching. So I teach only one class per semester. And um, it, it's going to sound weird, but it's hard. It's in some ways harder because I can't teach the things I love to teach. I no longer teach the theory class, really. Are um, you paid full-time? Uh, full I'm a full-time right. lecturer, yes. And I'm also on a three-year contract. And I joke, really, that, um, that for, when people ask me if I'm tenured, I say, well, I'm as tenured as you can get for a lecturer, right? Which, you know, it's... it's funny and it's not funny, right? Because there's always that element of, well, but you're still a lecturer, right? There's the issues of being rehired and things like that after um, three-year contracts. So um, when I became Director of Program Review and Assessment, which was a steep learning curve, which is basically I oversee program review and assessment uh, for 179 or so programs on the campus, um, I then found another niche for myself which is academic affairs assessment planning. And so I began working more closely with our regional accreditor, which is WASC. Uh, I applied for and was accepted to the Assessment Leadership Academy. I honed my skills in assessment at that academy, which what, it again brought more opportunities for me. I now consult um, with universities and I also co-facilitate the WASC Region's Assessment 101 um, workshop series, which I've now been doing uh, for two years after we finish in May. Uh, so with, with, with that experience, you know, I, I talk about how I sought out opportunities. And the reason I sought out opportunities was because I, I was place bound. Um, my husband moved across the country to um, be with me when I was accepted in, uh, at UC Irvine. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, he sacrificed a lot to support me for graduate school. Then he got a, a, a very good position with a major multinational corporation. And it was kind of, you know, my turn. Um, he, he always said, hey, if you wanted to apply, I'll go with you wherever you wanted to go. But really, you know, given our relationship, I felt like he's got a solid job. I have a solid job. I'm welcome in this department. You know, we're really place bound. And so I kind of did a half-hearted dabble in the tenure track search, but I really didn't do much. And since I really didn't do much, what could I do to have some kind of professional um, self-satisfaction, given that I was in a, a non-tenure track position? And quite frankly, um, as an 18th century British historian, a modern Europeanist, there was not a very big likelihood that there would ever be a tenure track position opening up uh, for me. Um, at my university or in the surrounding region because most of those scholars are, are quite far removed from retirement age. So um, given that circumstance, given that I was place bound and didn't have a lot of options, um, I kind of um, insinuated myself into administration um, and uh, found that I did have a really good knack for it, um, that I have um, uh, good diplomatic skills when I want to, uh, and, uh, and that it's, uh, it's an alternative to teaching five classes a semester, right? Um, and Monique did point out that there were people who mentioned in the survey that their university very specifically um, rejects opportunities for non-tenure track faculty members to become part of the administration. I recognize that. So this isn't, you know, unicorns and rainbows and you too can be like me if only you try. I recognize that I have a very unique position in many ways and I'm very lucky in many ways, but if there are opportunities on your campus to, to um, you know, take a, a, a faculty uh, center 
professional development course or somebody would want you to serve on a committee, um, jump at those chances. I will point out that this is not something that benefited me as a lecturer in and of itself. Um, the um, party line, so to speak, is basically lecturers are not required to engage in service. Engaging in service might benefit lecturers um, in terms of their professional uh, uh, self-satisfaction, but they are not going to be punished if they do not engage in, in service. And then that's incredibly important, right? Because um, if you have somebody who's been a long-term lecturer um, and they're teaching five classes and then you have somebody like me and I'm doing all this other stuff, but I'm still uh, being assessed within my department as, as my, in terms of my teaching, does that other stuff trump the other faculty member, right? And so in terms of the lecture position, um, it's neither for you or against you in terms of engaging in service. And, and that's very important to recognize. But I will say this, engaging in service opened doors for me that I did not think were possible. And uh, it started small. It started serving on some very small subcommittee that met two or three times a year that produced a, a film series or something like that. And then it moved to something a little bit more formal within my department. Um, and uh, uh, I got to attend ultimately the Assessment Leadership Academy on consulting regionally. And another component of that is that I've still continued my research. Um, last year, um, or two years ago, I, we published a textbook. Again, completely outside the framework of a traditional trajectory for academics, right? Your first book should be your dissertation. I'm still, when you're talking about this at dinner, I'm still working on that, um, finalizing all the, the research for that in terms of producing it in, into a mono, put, putting it into a monograph. And it's probably going to be a micro history or a graphic history. It's not even going to be a traditional monograph. Um, I've, I've received uh, um, money from the college, uh, $5,000 last year, to engage uh, in research in Wales. Um, so, you know, I have been able to maintain my professional identity as a historian while I'm going into uh, administration, while I'm bridging, you know, academic affairs and student affairs and working with partnerships with my student affairs complement. Um, but again, where did that start come from? Um, Yes, I had gumption. Yes, I went out there and I said, oh yeah, I think yeah, the assessment's kind of cool. It's what I already do at the local level, micro, and I just apply it you know, to the macro. So you kind of take your skills and you build them. But it all began really with the chair of the department typing on her computer behind the little cubicle border as I walked into the department saying, Charlene, do you want to teach a history and theory class next term? And I said, yes. Thanks. <laughs> Charlie? Yeah. Hi. Um, my responsibility on the committee was to review uh, and comment on uh, the department chair survey and the student survey, uh, rather the survey of student expectations uh, of non-tenure track faculty. And I'm gonna briefly summarize the data from each survey. In doing so, I'm gonna mention some statistics. I don't expect anyone to remember them. Uh, as Lynn pointed out, uh, the results are gonna be published in perspectives very shortly. I'm also gonna be using a variety of terms to describe non-tenure track faculty with the realization that each of them means something specific depending on the institution, but I'm going to keep using different terms because I'm going to keep repeating myself. Uh, what I plan to mostly do uh, is highlight what I found the most significant outcomes of these uh, surveys to be, uh, paying particular reference to the community colleges, which is the sector which uh, I'm on the committee to represent. The questions in the community, in the uh, chair survey, I drew responses from 172 colleagues. Now, most of the chairs who responded managed departments at four-year colleges and universities, uh, the largest number of which were public. Only 7% uh, of the chair responses came from those employed at two-year or community colleges. And of course, I found this unfortunate because 
Um, the fact of the matter is uh, uh, adjunct faculty teach well more than 50% of the classes uh, at the nation's vast community college system. Um, surprisingly to most of us, 72% of the chairs answered that they had worked at one point or another uh, as adjuncts. Now, in the future, I think we need more information uh, specifically on the average amount of time uh, current chairs spent off the tenure track, the length of time between their adjunct experience and their gaining a, a tenure track position. Because I, this is important because uh, non-tenure track teaching as a visiting lecturer or an adjunct used to be considered as a sort of an apprenticeship uh, that would kind of give you an advantage in seeking a tenure track position. That, that's not the case anymore. Uh, and uh, I suspect that perhaps the dated memories of one short-term adjunct service may affect the way in which chairs and tenured faculty view today's adjunct experience. And I'll illustrate that in a moment. Regarding the numbers of uh, tenure track faculty teaching in their department, the chairs were given only three options to which they could respond. Full-time under a multi-year contract, full-time holding a one-year contract, and part-time. Now, uh, the chairs reported that 59% of their non-tenure track faculty taught in one or two-year full-time categories. That looks much better, I think, than the situation in fact is. Uh, because as we began to review the results, we realized that these categories did not cover uh, the range of agreements under which non-tenure track faculty teach. We need much more information uh, to better assess the conditions of their employment. Moreover, if the survey results would have been vastly different uh, if two-year colleges had been better represented. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are virtually no full-time non-tenure track faculty teaching in community colleges, certainly not in California where I, do, where I work. Uh, virtually all uh, are adjuncts teaching part-time, no more than two or three classes in institutions where the tenured faculty course load is usually five per semester uh, or three to four per quarter. The types of classes most often taught by non-tenure track faculty, according to the chairs, were surveys or introductory courses, though some also teach upper division uh, in graduate courses. Now this is a dramatic change from the situation that prevailed back in 1970, which of course was a time when only about 20% of all college and university faculty uh, were adjuncts. At that time, adjuncts were employed to teach specialized courses, not taught by tenured faculty, or courses which were only offered on occasion. Today, contingent faculty are mostly employed to teach introductory courses that fill general education requirements. These are the courses that most history students will take, or most students will take. And in many cases, they're the only course in history that students will take. They're being taught by adjuncts. Non-tenure track faculty, of course, often have expressed dissatisfaction with their exclusion from departmental activities and lack of institutional resources available to them. We certainly saw that in Monique's report. Well, these concerns were presented to chairs by asking them whether non-tenure track faculty in their institutions were permitted to participate in departmental activities. Chairs responded that about 91% of contingent faculty attended lectures, receptions, other departmental events, and about half were involved in curriculum development. They reported that smaller but still significant percentages of adjuncts participated in faculty governance and uh, served on MA or PhD committees. Very interestingly though, <laughs> the perceptions of adjunct involvement by chairs were considerably more positive uh, in every instance than were the responses non-tenure track faculty supplied to the same or similar questions in our parallel survey. Regarding the availability of institutional resources to non-tenure track faculty, the difference between chairs' perceptions and those of adjuncts were even more dramatic. For example, chairs claimed that teaching performance of their adjuncts, very important, was assessed annually in 72% of their institutions. Only 
of contingent faculty reported annual teaching assessments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turning to the student survey, there was a total of 537 responses to the student experience of non-tenured uh, faculty. The majority of the response were history majors, full-time students, uh, and in fact, nearly one-third of them were in their fourth year of college. When students were asked if they understood the difference between tenure, tenure track faculty and non-tenure track faculty, the response was about equally divided. About 52% declared that they did, while 48% responded negatively. The largest cohort of students, about 44%, uh, stated that they had never taken a history course taught by an adjunct. 28% wrote that they had done so. 28% said, I don't know. Uh, when asked to rate the quality of non-tenure track instructors on a scale ranging from one, extremely poor, to 10, excellent, the largest cohort of respondents, about 24%, awarded a 10, top marking. In fact, fully 75% of the responses were favorable on adjunct teaching. The two final open-ended questions provided some revealing answers. When students were given a choice between taking a course from a full-time and a part-time faculty member, only 41% responded that they would have a preference. But of those expressing preference, 96% chose full-time over part-time. Now, the student survey indicated the concern, that concern over whether a course is taught by a tenured professor or an adjunct instructor is not particularly important to most, and that when students are aware of that their instructors are not on the tenure track, they still rate their teaching highly. But these results were drawn from a selection of numerical ratings within a prescribed range. Unfortunately, few students contributed written comments and those who did gave very terse responses. Some of those I found more interesting. Adjuncts were just as passionate as tenured professors. Their classes were just as rigorous, but their availability was much more limited. Contingent faculty assigned less writing, but gave more examinations, and I'm presuming those were objective. Based on the results of our surveys and the growing body of literature on what one can call the adjunctification of the professoriate, what have we learned? Aside from discovering that we need much more research, honestly, I don't think we learned much more that we didn't already know. Contingent faculty regard low salaries, non-existent job security, lack of health and retirement benefits, little to no support for scholarship, a considerable difference in perception on either side of the tenure line, and a sometimes subtle, sometimes blatant lack of respect as the core problems that they face year to year. As I read the responses, it occurred to me that adjunct exploitation of labor is labor exploitation with a kind of a twist. Unemployed or poorly paid blue collar workers are responsible for their dire straits because they didn't work hard enough and get good educations. <laughs> Adjunct faculty did work hard enough and got excellent educations. Their failure was to make the bad decision of entering a weak academic labor market just because they love teaching and scholarship and think that educating people, even in much aligned, uh, maligned humanities, is a worthy effort. See, it's their fault too, just like the workers. The problems identified by adjuncts in our survey when put into the context of other studies, have been shown to affect not only those who are untenured, but also to impact negatively the work lives of tenured faculty and of the education of college and university students. The dwindling numbers of tenured and tenure track faculty bear virtually all of the responsibility for peer evaluation, curriculum development, assessment of student learning outcomes, increasing evidence of student success and equity, and shared governance. And it's not as though tenured faculty are free from the intensive demands of teaching. See, many assume that on the hierarchy of higher education, those on the lowest rung of the ladder, 
community college professors, spend all their time in classroom instruction, while those on the top rung, professors at Research One institutions, rarely face students in a classroom. Well, according to recent statistics compiled by the U.S. Department of Education study on national post-secondary education, all higher education faculty are first and foremost teachers. Naturally, community colleges most so. Community college faculty devote 91.3% of their paid time to teaching, but professors at comprehensive four-year colleges and universities spend 90.8%, about the same, time in teaching. And even at public research universities, professors devote 74% of their paid time to teaching, not research. And remember, these statistics include the hard sciences, where, where research one professors are likely to spend more time in research. So I think if we were looking at only historians, there would be more teaching. The fact that so much of higher education is provided by contingent faculty has not improved the educational experience for students. Although the majority of the students we surveyed ranked adjuncts as very effective teachers, they also noted that adjunct faculty were also unavailable outside of the classroom. Now, those results have drawn different conclusions depending on which one you focus upon. Favorable student ratings of adjunct faculty have been alluded to by some tax-shy state legislators as a sound reason for public colleges and universities to decrease tenure lines. I mean, why pay higher salaries to tenured faculty when the adjuncts are doing a great job of instruction? However, the limited contact between students and adjuncts is a serious problem. Researchers have increasingly agreed that faculty-student interaction outside of the classroom is very important for student success, particularly for students from traditionally underrepresented groups. Moreover, some studies indicate that institutions with large numbers of adjuncts have lower graduation rates and that students who took an introductory course from an adjunct are less likely to be successful in more advanced courses taught by tenured faculty. Now, these conclusions were not represented as evidence that adjunct faculty are inferior teachers, but rather that they lack the institutional support to maintain the level of student contact necessary to maximize student success. As I noted earlier, the ratio of uh, adjunct to tenure, tenure track faculty is least favorable in the community colleges, and it's worsened with time. You know, in 1970, when about 78% of all college and university faculty were full-time, um, at present, <laughs> only about 25 or 30%, you'll notice discrepancy in these figures because they're, they're really variable by study, but uh, I would argue that only about 25 or 30 percent of all university and college faculty are identified as full-time. Of the 70 to 75 percent status that is contingent, more than half teach in community colleges, and those institutions now enroll about half of all the nation's college students. In California, my state and our most populous state, 68 percent of all students enrolled in public higher education institutions in the fall of 2013 attended a community college. It's difficult to come up with adjunct to tenured ratios for community college historians. Since most community colleges are organized in multidisciplinary departments, do not list in the AHA directory, and provide little information outside of uh, local areas or states. But I can give you one example. From my institution, San Diego Mesa College, uh, which has an enrollment of between 25 and 30,000 students, and which I'm proud to say does list in the HA directory. I had to get that in. Uh, the history department is in the School of Social Behavioral Sciences and Multicultural Studies, of which I'm dean. About 14,000 students take classes every semester in our school. About 2,700 of those are enrolled in history courses. And even though we've recently begun to hire tenure track faculty after an eight-year hiatus, we still have only 31 tenured tenure track faculty and about 110 adjuncts in our entire school. In history, 
Those numbers are four tenured, two tenure track, one of whom's sitting back there, I'm happy to say, and 20 adjuncts. And <laughs> since several of our more senior historians are teaching lesser loads, 74% of all history courses are presently being taught by adjuncts. 74%. So what can be done and who can do it? <laughs> the AHA, as has already been mentioned, is committed to continuing to provide forums for discussion and opportunities for research, uh, hopefully funded by an agency or a donor that can pay for a more comprehensive and sophisticated study that we need. Adjunct faculty can, and my advice should, seek union recognition, and tenured faculty can support these efforts even if they themselves are not organized. Better pay benefits in some form of job security, but not tenure track jobs, can be most effectively won through collective bargaining. However, among fully organized faculty, adjuncts and tenured alike, and that's very common in community colleges, collective bargaining for two groups of faculty with very different levels of job security can be problematic and divisive. Ultimately, in my opinion, only political action by faculty, administrators, students, and concerned citizens can make the changes necessary to improve professional conditions for the largest number of faculty, and not coincidentally, to protect tenure from disappearing from the academic scene. The best solution is, of course, one that would restore the balance between tenured, tenure track positions and contingent academic positions back to where it was about 50 years ago. That is 80% to 20%, almost a complete reverse of today's ratio. But that would necessitate the earmarking of far more public money for public higher education. And unfortunately, this is going to be difficult given the political climate of the last 35 years or so. During that period, fiscal investment in higher education has declined steadily, and since most of this investment is uh, vested at the state level, the state level electoral success of Republicans, who tend to view higher education as a personal utility, rather than it should be supported by those who access it, rather than by the general public. Now, that's worse than the situation. The 24 states wholly controlled by the GOP have been least supportive of public education at all levels, not just higher ed. Given the fact that state legislators are presently unlikely to devote significant resources to funding tenure track positions or improving adjunct salaries or benefits, I think that in the short term, those who can best improve the situation for adjunct faculty are tenured colleagues, chairs, and deans, mainly by practicing inclusion by listening carefully to the concerns of adjuncts, and by responding with solutions that may not be grand, but are practical. And I can close with one example of a small scale but popular improvement from my own recent experience. It involves the non-spectacular issue of mailboxes. Recently, we moved into a very nice new social behavioral sciences building in which almost all history and six other discipline classes are taught. Tenured faculty have private offices on the third floor. There are two large shared adjunct offices and two conference rooms reserved for adjuncts who want to meet privately with students. There's also a mail room with a built-in bank of mailboxes, but only in a number sufficient for our tenured and tenure track faculty. The 75 or 80 adjuncts who teach in the building had to walk way across campus to a central facility containing a rather bleak room uh, filled with hundreds of mailboxes. I began hearing complaints, almost always secondhand. Again, adjunct faculty are not going to barge into the dean's office and complain. Um, adjuncts felt that it was just another sign of disrespect, that they had to schlep to get their mail, while tenured faculty simply had to walk a couple of feet from their offices to the mail room. Well, since I still had some furnishings and equipment money remaining in our new building fund, I purchased a large bank of mailboxes. I had them installed in the same mailroom holding the tenured faculty mailboxes. And the response I got from adjuncts was much more positive than I had expected. 
Now look, I know that this is far from heroic, and it doesn't address the major difficulties endured by adjunct faculties, but today, one does what one can. I have no authority to raise adjunct salaries. I can't improve their health benefits. I can't give them job security. But at least they now receive mail in the same manner as all other faculty. It was a small step, but I think it demonstrated that we take the concerns of our adjunct colleagues seriously, try to respond to them as best we can, and we must all continue to do so. Thank you. Alrighty, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to sort of in the uh, back and forth go with a little bit of a self story here, uh, much in the way uh, what Charlene shared. Um, and as the, uh, as the professional adjunct, uh, which is sort of what I must acknowledge that my, my career is, um, I, I hope it doesn't come off as a, as a woe is me kind of story, um, and it's not that bad. Um, but it is something where I think in terms of what this committee was about and what our charge was, uh, I hope to relate some of the aspects in, in terms of how it has impacted uh, my performance in the classroom, uh, my desires for what I would like to do in the classroom, what I am able to do, um, and, and how this uh, looks to move forward perhaps. Um, as, as Lynn said at the beginning, I, uh, I graduated uh, from Ohio State and moved to New York City. Uh, that in and of itself creates a bit of the story or the backdrop for my uh, conditions uh, working uh, in the sense of I know that uh, there are, with the colleges in New York, some greater opportunities to teach. Uh, however, the cost of living in New York is not exactly one conducive to the adjunct lifestyle or the adjunct paycheck, to be more um, specific. Um, and I've been very fortunate. Um, when I arrived, uh, I arrived with several email exchanges with different colleges, different chairs, uh, but without any job in hand. Um, I was able to find a job at Lehman College, part of the City University of New York system. And uh, then shortly thereafter, uh, actually two weeks before the semester was to begin for the fall semester of 2006, uh, got a job teaching at St. John's University. Um, one of the things that has uh, sort of stuck with me as I've gone forward in this adjunct career um, uh, was a comment made by the individual who was then the chair of Lehman, uh, Lehman's history department uh, when he was hiring me uh, and asking in terms of what were my goals, what was I looking to do and pursue and uh, asking essentially, do you plan on applying for full-time jobs? Do you plan on staying in New York? What do you feel about this? Um, and of course, being fresh out of graduate school, I was, I am applying for jobs, I'm looking for jobs, I'm looking for jobs. I was not place bound at the time. Uh, and uh, he was glad to hear that, but gave me the warning of, you're, an, you're, you're fresh out of graduate school, you're now entering an adjunct career, and there's a danger to this. Uh, the danger of the fact that you will only be a fresh, viable candidate in the history market for about four or five years as, as you go a little bit longer without being hired and more graduate students come out in the meantime. You're just not as sexy as you used to be, I guess you could say. Um, so the tenure track aspect might be one that would disappear. And with that, he said that there is a trap to the adjunct lifestyle in the sense that you can find that you can get enough classes in that will make your, make your rent payments, make some bill payments, give you enough money to go out to a restaurant, uh, to hit a local pub, to go, buy yourself a new pair of shoes, uh, you know, to enjoy your life a little bit, but it was nothing that would allow you to move forward and progress uh, with career development. Um, and it's something that has uh, stuck with me in terms of something I'm reminded of here and there as we move forward. Uh, but as I mentioned, I've been very fortunate for the past 10 years to be uh, teaching still at those two institutions. Um, I've had uh, a good relationship with the chairs, um, and uh, with colleagues in, in various ways, mostly with fellow adjunct colleagues, and I say that specifically at one institution where I do have an office, uh, and I'm able to see these individuals. But um, I've been able to get uh, enough classes at, at Lehman College, um, which would be my quote-unquote full-time school. 
Uh, and I've been there long enough where I have written in my contract now that I'm guaranteed classes, although with the quotes around it, because uh, as long as there are enough students to fill those classes, as long as they can offer me a class, and as well uh, as long as tenured faculty uh, have enough students in their classes to hold them so that they're able to meet their course loads. Um, I have since at Lehman, uh, because there are problems with enrollment, um, outside of teaching history courses, uh, I've gone into what is the FYI program, a freshman year initiative program where I'm able to teach history courses um, for true freshmen, as well as teaching a freshman seminar, which is not exactly what I thought I'd be doing, uh, but it pays the bills. Uh, it is a chance to interact with students uh, in a liberal arts manner, uh, as well as to, of course, then uh, make sure that I have money to live on. Um, at Lehman as well, with the union that is there, I do have health insurance, although it is a limited health insurance, one that if I do not teach three classes in a semester, uh, I will lose that and have to accrue then two semesters um, in a row with at least six hours for each of those semesters to get my health insurance back. Um, as I recently found out over this past summer, the health insurance doesn't cover as much as I thought it did. Um, St. John's University, again, 10 years there, um, and usually one or two classes. Uh, I've been fortunate there. Um, it is a history department that is often bound by the enrollment of the students uh, and what they are able to hold in terms of courses. So fall semester, I can get one almost guaranteed, sometimes two, a spring semester, is something where it's usually sometime in late December, I, I'm, I'm told uh, we have a class we can offer it to you, do you want it? Um, so again, very fortunate with the changing enrollments, uh, general education requirements I should add as well because I know with uh, the city of New York system, uh, the requirements for students to take liberal arts courses has been diminished, uh, so students are no longer uh, for general education, required to take as many history courses, American studies courses, uh, therefore the enrollments have dropped off a bit or the number of courses being offered have dropped off. Uh, to supplement then this, my income, uh, working at Fordham University in a continuing education program, which has been most intellectually stimulating. I get to create my own courses. I do so semester after semester, which uh, I'm reminded of the work that goes into creating a class. Uh, it is in many ways in continuing education uh, in the structure of the system. There are no exams. There are no uh, uh, any form of, a, form of assessment. It's almost like a seminar series or a lecture series for a semester, which is uh, very stimulating. Uh, but as I was told, it's half a class, so it's half pay. Um, so that's a little bit of what goes on there. Now, with this as well, um, teaching in Manhattan, teaching in, actually teaching in Queens, teaching in uh, Manhattan, teaching in the Bronx. I have a lot of subway miles I build up, which fits in as well to, again, this not so much the quality of life issue, although it impacts that, but how I'm able to, and I think as was mentioned, my availability to students, um, being able to actually hold office hours, being able to, uh, especially if I'm going from one school to another, um, what I'm able to give to students. Um, Within this time, um, I have uh, tried to continue the road of professional growth, um, looking to enhance my uh, career, uh, my abilities in the classroom, attending various seminars offered by the universities uh, on teaching in the classroom. Uh, I was, and one of the things that I think that we've seen and we're seeing a bit more of, for, especially for adjuncts and something I would definitely encourage, uh, being trained and certified in online education. It has been a lifesaver for me in many ways in terms of a little bit of a saving what little hair I have um, from falling out, in less travel, less graying uh, in that sense. But um, you know, being able to work from home uh, as opposed to having to log the hours in uh, is something very beneficial. Uh, it's helped me stay up to date with changing classroom techniques, technology, um, and it has presented more opportunities. It's made me a bit more of an attractive hire uh, within the universities and schools that I teach at. Um, I've published, I've presented, I've applied for jobs uh, 
four-year research law at colleges, community colleges, as well throughout this time. Um, and the issue uh, for me, though, has really been one of late of burnout, I would say. Um, in 2014, I taught 17 classes in the calendar year, which included uh, fall semester six classes, spring semester class six classes, two courses over the winter session, and three courses over the summer. And I think at that point I realized it was something where, am I able to give my students what I need? Have I been able to update my lectures? Have I really gone through fully as I should uh, and examine new textbooks, uh, examine what I'm doing in the classroom and how I'm embracing um, what time I do have for my students. Uh, and even with several of those courses being online, it was still something where um, I would liken it to being a doctor and being on call, um, going home and answering emails for two hours and updating Blackboard courses, um, things of that nature, knowing that I'm going to get an email at three in the morning from a student saying, why didn't you respond when I submitted my paper two hours ago? Um, and it's something I expect and I understand, but um, it was the balance of, of lifestyle with the needs of students, the needs of the classroom, um, and something I was conscious of. Um, and it was basically at the end of that calendar year where I was asked to join this committee, uh, recommended by uh, one of the department chairs I worked with. And in terms of what I have uh, done in terms of teaching uh, and discussions with my colleagues, um, it was something that really just coincided with where I was at professionally and something that I was hoping that uh, through my experiences and through my discussions I would be able to bring something into how, uh, at the very least, how we began to structure going forward and I, I think uh, where perhaps I was um, uh, most productive was helping get going with some of the questions, the lines of thinking and even when we put together our surveys uh, at the beginning. Um, so there were two points that I was looking at in, in terms of how we, again, addressing adjuncts in the classroom, address, ad addressing this issue. Um, first, this idea of, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, progressing as an instructor, progressing uh, as a scholar, and of course then the offshoot benefits that that would give to my students. Um, this constant desire to build upon, restructure courses and course materials having the time, having the availability, and even having sort of the personal incentive to do this, um, knowing that a course can easily be regurgitated in some ways, and if you're not being checked up upon, then no harm, no foul to an extent. Uh, it can be a bit lazy, definitely, and it's part of the thought process, I would say, that does indeed uh, go on. Um, but something that, of course, is not going to benefit students, especially, as we know, where uh, 10 years of teaching, well, 10 years ago is not today. Um, as in teaching in New York, realizing the students who were six years old or five years old when 9-11 took place are not college freshmen, uh, are college sophomores. Um, and so their ideas of what history are means uh, and what's taken place in the meantime are vastly different than what one might expect. Um, the desire to develop professionally um, and I think as Charlene mentioned, talking about her dissertation, uh, I haven't even gotten that far. Um, it's a catch-22 in the sense of time and money. Um, being able to take time away from teaching to go back to the archives of Cuyahoga County, of the Western Reserve Historical Society, um, to interview various individuals before they pass away back in Northeast Ohio, um, but at the same time be able to pay rent and pay my other bills back in New York City. Um, it means teaching, and it means taking away time would be taking away my ability to sort of function and live there. Um, the second um, was something about the lines of, uh, and this gets to more of what Monique had talked about, um, the adjunct within the department and the adjunct as the other. And this was something I think I was looking at um, as the committee moved forward. Um, and for me, one of the big examples um, in terms of how adjuncts were seen, how they were viewed and treated. And I guess the, the asterisk before I say that is that um, I have no complaints about mistreatment um, being uh, 
degraded in any way within the office. Um, but I would say that there is just a general notion of people know who tenures, or who's tenured, who's tenure track, and who's adjunct. Um, and one of the things that happened at Lehman College that really sort of shed light on this for me was when I first arrived there, and I don't know if this was a temporary situ situation or whatever, but um, I shared an office with a tenure track faculty. Um, I had an office, an office space, and I worked with an individual um, who was the former chair there. And it was something where uh, it, was, um, it was a feeling of inclusion in many ways. Uh, once offices had been restructured, however, um, it was changed so that two tenured or tenure track faculty shared an office together, and the adjuncts were moved together into one office. Um, it's friendly and fun in a sort of bad sitcom kind of manner as you have six or seven adjuncts sharing four desks with three computers, two of which are attached to the internet. Um, sitting on desks, sitting on chairs, uh, and discussing our teaching, discussing our lives, and different things along there. Uh, individuals who are near retirement, who are post-retirement age, but still teaching. Uh, individuals who are in the Graduate Center in New York, and looking forward to their careers coming up as they graduate. Um, but the idea of sort of being penned together almost um, was something different. Um, it lets you know who you are and where you're at. Um, however, it is an office, and it's not something I have at other schools. Um, within that as well, I know that I cannot advise students. Um, I can't really advise students um, on any sort of even unofficial level, although I have had meetings with certain students regarding dissertation topics just to give them some suggestions, some insight before they go back to their advisors. Um, work with graduate students is minimal at best. Um, and I have told students who want letters of recommendation that it might be better for them to get it from a full-time faculty simply because that would carry more weight, as it would turn out. Um, so the committee work was personal um, in some ways because it paralleled concerns that I had and continue to have about, uh, about this career. Um, so in terms of what we did with a lot of the questions in the surveys and what you'll see in some of the, you know, what information is eventually published, um, trying to look at you know, how these conditions, uh, and what I share with you, um, trying to sort of see how, and I don't, again, New York City, it's not going to be the same, but the ideas of transportation, um, individuals with competition from the number of, in, uh, number of potential uh, adjuncts or part-time faculty that are in a city, uh, working within an institution, um, being place-bound or not being place-bound, um, looking at the cost of living of an area. Um, factors that are not sort of the focus of our study in terms of our charge of looking again at what takes place in the classroom, but definitely elements that have uh, a severe impact, um, a very heavy impact on what we are doing, what we are looking at and teaching and going forward. Um, just some things that just basically as I finish up here, um, that did sort of make me sort of look and look twice and think a little bit um, from our findings. Um, the majority of individuals who identified as part-time faculty were Americanists, um, which was something where I want to go back and find an advisor and say, why did you let me do this? Why did you, why did you let me go this route? But again, um, it's, it's something about, um, you know, as we look at what is being produced amongst PhDs within the field of history um, and how we look at programs and departments and the responsibilities they might have in terms of uh, pushing students forward um, as they go in their professional careers in terms of what's available in the market, what's going to be the, <clears throat> the jobs that uh, will be out there. Uh, the availability of online training for adjuncts is something that I stand behind completely. Um, and something that I would hope, and I know many colleagues who have simply said, I have a VHS collection, that's as far as I go with technology. It's not going to get any more modern, and I will deal with that as it comes. But I, I think it is something that can help the individual uh, make herself or himself something more available. Um, the anger and disappointment from some of the anecdotal information that we saw in our survey um, is something 
that goes along the lines with a wish for more recognition. And I think this is definitely, if we talk about just basic elements of what we can do to make this body of faculty um, feel more comfortable um, within the department, within the institution, and I think what will definitely then transfer uh, to their, pr their presence in the classroom, uh, that's what we need to improve uh, and can be improved first and foremost before we go to more uh, economic, labor-intensive uh, issues. Um, so again, I say this um, not for the woe is me of, of, of teaching um, or any sort of, you know, with every rainbow there must be rain, but I, I say this uh, because my, for me, again, with the, with the idea of the self-story, um, just to sort of show how uh, I think it can impact, and for me it has impact, what I do in the classroom, and where part of, uh, from our foundation, where we try to go with building ideas uh, to begin to address in, in our survey with students, in our survey with faculty, and uh, our survey with chairs, um, some of these ideas which are going to impact the classroom uh, in some way, directly or indirectly. Um, so I will leave you with that. Thank you for your time. I'm just going to very briefly give you a summary of the actual recommendations the AHA is going to make and then ask for your comments um, for what you would like the AHA to do uh, on this issue. Um, our report is preliminary. Um, as you can probably tell from the varied uh, speakers, we have found that the identity of non-tenure track faculty um, is very complicated. It's part-time. It's full-time, it's course-by-course, course, it's multi-year contracts, it's the professional architect who teaches one course, it's the graduate student who teaches a course, um, and we use names all over the place for them. And some of the folks we surveyed got real angry at us for using certain names. So we, we need to find a way to come up with a nomenclature and a definition for what the non-tenure track world looks like, and it's really, really different than it was 20 years ago. It's been changing very rapidly, and I don't think that the uh, professional associations have caught up. Um, as you noticed, uh, there's a lot of differences between how department chairs see the world of the non-tenure track uh, professor and how the professors, non-tenure track professors, see that world. Um, as was pointed out, they differed on every single question. So that's something I think that needs to be addressed. Um, we did find, I think overall, that students are pretty indifferent to the status of their teachers, and that seems to confirm other studies as well. So our recommendation, recommendations are as follows. We need to determine more accurate uh, nomenclature and definitions for the non-tenure track world. We need to update our recommendations made in 2003 that are still on the Coalition for the, on the Academic Workplace website. Um, as the nature of non-tenure track teaching has changed so much. We need further research. But there are simple guidelines that we can recommend to department chairs and universities, as we've suggested already. And basically it's inclusion. Basically that departments need to acknowledge non-tenure track faculty fully as colleagues in the work of teaching our students. They need to be invited to department meetings, lectures. They should be always treated with respect. If teaching awards are given, they should include uh, non-tenure track teaching awards, and their accomplishments should be recognized as well. Non-tenure track faculty should be guaranteed the basic tools they need for successful work with students, including mailboxes, including access to computers that are hooked up to the internet, uh, including copy and printing machines, parking, and office supplies. They should be provided with office space, although I say that now with trepidation after listening to you, Phil. And they should also have space to meet with students privately. They should be able to take part in faculty development and teaching workshops and training. That does not come at a big cost to a university. When financially feasible, they should have access to travel and conference funds. And they should have their teaching evaluated as full-time Tenure track folks do. I was surprised to see how many say that they are, they are not evaluated, they're teaching. We acknowledge the difficulty of administrators in planning for last minute course changes.
Charlie and I have both been deans, and we know that two days before a semester, a person can get sick or die or tell you all of a sudden they're leaving, and you have to fill that class. That's the reason so often that classes are filled at the last minute. But sometimes that's not the reason. Sometimes it's bad planning. And what we have to do is encourage um, as much as we can that uh, non-tenure track faculty be hired far ahead as possible. Sometimes union contracts, uh, for example, if, if a class, for example, if you're hired for a class and it doesn't have enough students and the non-tenure track person is told that they can't teach the class, uh, with union contracts, sometimes they are given some compensation for that, for that preparation. But another question, a, more, a larger question in a way, is how can we as the AHA work with other scholarly societies to develop national strategies? The MLA, the OAH, which Don is chairing uh, a session in April, the CCAS, which is the Dean's Organization, AERA, which is the Educator's Organization, and other groups have recently surveyed, all of them have surveyed the changing conditions of non-tenure track teachers. There needs to be a summary of what these different surveys show us, uh, along with the national um, huge amount of literature that's coming out every day. Possibly the ACLS or the AACNU or ACE would be a place to start. These are national educational, higher education organizations with a discussion representing the range of scholarly societies on these issues. But since the conditions for historians seem to differ, I think a start will be uh, to reestablish cooperation with the Organization of American Historians, which shares the interest in non-tenure track uh, professors. Above all, this exercise over the past year has shown the five of us what we don't know. We recommend and we have recommended to the AHA that a professional social science researcher structure a more sophisticated survey instrument and then provide an analysis of where we as historians are with uh, tenured and tenure track and the non-tenure track uh, professoriate in our discipline. So thank you for listening and, and now we'd really like to hear from you and to see have we completely missed the boat on anything? Uh, have you got other ideas? Would you like to confirm any of what you've heard? Uh, so we open it up to your comments. Done. And if everyone would speak up, because this uh, room swallows sound. Well, Donald Rogers, I'm uh, an adjunct at uh, three schools in uh, Connecticut, so I, uh, I understand what the bill is going through. You know, so I'm a new scholar. Uh, I'm also chair of the uh, Organization of American Historians Committee on part-time uh, contingent, uh, part uh, contingent faculty. Uh, First off, I think that you do a wonderful job. But the survey was, was really well done and very articulately uh, you know, analyzed. Uh, and just a, just a couple of points about the survey. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Zappia's, Dean Zappia's point about looking at community college is a really, really important point in all the people look at surveys. And, uh, and uh, based upon what I know, uh, and you're right, is that uh, the contingent uh, part of the faculty in community college is up 78. You know, overwhelmingly a contingent. Uh, and most surveys are not included. I mean, the one of the surveys done by Robert Townsend, he was deputy director of the AHA, did not include community colleges. So his survey is always about baccalaureate programs and research institutions. So I think that you're, you're on, on, on the right track there. I uh, certainly agree with that. Um, uh, I know where the 28% uh, figure came from. It, it comes from, there's a, uh, I'll be glad to share that with the Humanities Indicator Study. Of the, this is from the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, what's the date on that? Uh, 2012. Uh, and what does it measure? Pardon me? What does it measure? I'm sorry. What does it measure? What schools does it look at? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, gee, I don't know. So, uh, so uh, we just threw that in there, and it's one of our, Panelists said uh, we've got numbers all over the place. Right. We have numbers with a gigantic range. That's why, in the end, uh, we think that our most valuable recommendation is to get uh, a real study done with someone who can really, you know, do it. Uh, there are other earlier studies that have looked at, you know, adjuncts in the history department, and it's much higher, twenty percent, sure. ten or fifteen years ago. So, so like the point I would make about that is I think that twenty-eight uh, percent is too low. Is very, very suspicious. Yeah. Very, very, very skeptical of that. Uh, and um, 
Um, I very much like your, your recommendation, Dan, about reaching out to the organization. You know, and so, uh, you know, reaching out your hand to the OEH, we reach the hand back again. We very much uh, would like, like to uh, cooperate and work with you. And as I was listening to you, it would have been wonderful. We had an occasion for members of the OEH committee to sit down with members of this committee and talk about what, what, we're, what we're doing together. Uh, there is an organization called the Coalition on the Academic Workforce, yes. uh, which uh, you didn't mention. Uh, no, but we didn't have did a report. Right. So, uh, but, uh, uh, which the AHA is a member of, uh, and has on occasion done some important things, uh, including producing the, the, the 2012 survey uh, issue brief uh, a year or so earlier. And I mean, that's, that's a, uh, a vehicle that's in place that has a number of professional societies already as members. Uh, is now sort of looking for a new agenda, and I think that might be a place uh, where the AHA uh, might, might, might jump in. Uh, I had a recent uh, uh, conference call, and they're basically thinking about what to do next. You know, that the, what to do next is going to be the subject of their next conference call, the Coalition on the Academic uh, uh, So, um, for uh, some several suggestions about you know, what, what the AHA uh, might recommend, uh, uh, I agree with you that you want to lean in the direction of making recommendations of things that are not going to cost their <coughs> uh, And I think one thing to suggest is some kind of regularization or hiring. You know, and uh, you can't do it all the time, but to create stronger guarantees, you know, from one semester to the next, you know, for part-time faculty to know what they're going to be doing. And the points made by the panels about lack of planning is just right on point. So many, many, many good points on uh, the panels. So, um, you only alluded to professional development. I think that's simply something you could really uh, push a little bit harder uh, in regard to uh, you know, support for not only improving teaching, but also support for finishing manuscripts, uh, you know, for you know, publishing. Um, that you, your, your survey and recommendations haven't said very much about that. And, um, and I think what you want to think about is adjuncts have a future. Not just semester to semester, but they have a future. What are they going to be doing five years down the line, ten years down uh, the line? Uh, in terms of impact uh, on students, uh, one thing I would suggest is looking at the impact upon the ability to uh, uh, attract and keep history majors, whether it be in, uh, part time faculty has, has any impact upon that. Uh, there are some, some studies done which said basically that, that, uh, that departments attract more history majors when. Uh, full-time faculty who are there and have been continuity teach the survey classes rather than, rather than adjuncts. So I think that, that's the best scenario uh, that you might want to look at. Uh, and finally, last thing, and I'll be quiet, uh, we have so much to say from the OE, so much we would like to share from you. Uh, and that is, I, I agree with you, that I mean, unionization is one tool, you know, that, 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 that part-timers and full-timers might not turn to. And I might want to, you know, suggest that the AHA look uh, at the recent resolution adopted by the OEH Executive Board uh, for the AHA to consider whether it wants to endorse that resolution or issue a similar resolution of its own uh, to, again, for unionization is one tool uh, for improving the status of the Thank you. So those are my questions. Thank you very much. Are there other? other? Comments, ideas, thoughts? How about from the panel, having listened to each other for the first time? <laughs> well, I think I'll, I'll say something, um, because I love to talk. Um, but uh, we all had different stories to tell. I mean, Philip and I seem to be on, uh, on slightly different sides of the storytelling. And then Charles and Monique, uh, provided this, this they, they knitted together the stories um, of the anecdotal information that we received from the survey as well as the statistical information. And I think the line that's bringing everything together and that I tried to emphasize in my talk and certainly Philip's um, uh, discussion brings this up as well is that if we don't have the, if, let's forget monetary. I and mean, there's nothing that we can suggest in terms of monetary support 
but the collegiality issue is so very important. And the recognition that you're part of a larger community within the department is so very important. And we, we, you know, we get that sense of, you know, part of the reason I'm successful is I would love to say that I got a lot of gumption. I would love to say that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm great and, you know, I, I like to toot my own horn, but I was given opportunities because of people in my department willing, who were tenure track or tenured faculty and our department chair, who were willing to provide me those opportunities, to see me as a fellow faculty member, as a fellow professional historian, as someone who has something professional to offer the department and to offer the profession and to offer our students. And that line runs all the way through all of our talks. I mean, the mailbox issue is a really important issue. Um, and uh, it, because it, it means that you're not, like Phil said about the, the office space, you're being penned in, right? Um, there are these subtle kinds of shifts and, and, and sort of very nuanced um, uh, actions that take place um, that we need to, to, to recognize. And changing the culture is something that is, is what it, we're, or, or in some ways asking. That takes a long time. Um, and uh, I think that's why the, our recommendations were the focused recommendations that, that we put forth. Any other comments? How many of you guys, uh, again, are uh, teaching as adjuncts or non-tenure track faculty? Oh, so just one. one. So that's interesting. Um, wait, what are those? Graduate students. Graduate, Graduate students. students. Yeah. So. And, uh, as graduate students, when you're teaching assistants, that's not considered a non-tenure track, although it's doing the same work often. So, well, for, okay, let me ask the graduate students, from your perspective, what does your future profession look like? You know? I mean, what do you, what do you think about this? Because it, it's, it's a large sea change that's happening right now in uh, university teaching. So we're kind of waiting on a better study to, to figure out, which I know, which I understand needs to happen. But um, in the meantime, what are we doing? <laughs> it's, it's kind of where uh, where it's you know I'm at in this. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give kind of two answers, maybe. Um, on one side, you know, getting experience teaching as an adjunct before I graduate, something that's been recommended to me to help me on the job market. That's part of the reason I'm here. I feel like graduate students should be interested in this, um, in this issue. On the other side, in terms of kind of after graduation, what does the career look like? Um, it's been interesting comparing you know, this discussion to discussions about career diversity. And they're all framed, I guess, the backdrop of you can't count on a tenure track job for anything. I'm fortunate to be in a field where the job market isn't quite as bad as it is um, in others. Um, but uh, uh, what, what's, what makes me feel happy as a graduate student, or maybe not happy or encouraged is a better word, uh, is that AJ is promoting graduate students and faculty uh, and people from outside of uh, academic institutions, bring them together in conversations about a variety of paths. So that we can have a choice about: Do I want to be a professional adjunct? Do I want to be a professional something else that isn't a professor? So hopefully, more of that <laughs> would be great. Well, it's, it's nice to hear that the concern is elevating adjuncts and and, and making this look less like <coughs> martyrdom to, to those of us who haven't gotten there yet. Right? I, you put it well, sir. I would. You know, to be back in a corner because we want to build lives around writing and think, thinking and, and, and teaching, right? It, it, that there are sustainable alternatives that allow us to do those things that, um, you know, are, are, are still there, even in a, a very, very, very bleak. Uh, but it's been bleak before. I mean, yeah. you know, we're stories, right? And the job market's cyclical. And as long as I've been around it, there's been at least three large downturns, and then it's popped back, particularly for, for the humanities. 
and they've managed to come back, and they will come back again. They're down right now, and they they will come back again. Well, I'll share a little bit. I know you probably all go. Um, I was an adjunct for two years. I actually worked with Charlie. <laughs> um, so I was an ad so I graduated with my PhD in 2013, fully knowing that the market started to improve, but still dicey. Um, so I went into the adjunct game, not knowing what would happen. But I was fortunate. Um, I was hired full time on like tenure track this past spring um, because the economy was slowly starting to improve. But yes, I got a job, but there were hundreds and hundreds of other applicants who, um, you know, who were just as qualified as I was and is, but unfortunately didn't get the job. Um, so this is a sticky situation that I found myself in is that, oh, okay, this can be a little bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> because we want we want to promote collegiality, but there's an underlying competitiveness in the market. Um, we're we want to work together, but there's all what I'm speaking from when I was an adjunct. I want to work together with my fellow colleagues, but I want to still do that. Um, but I'm also competing with them for this lucrative tenure track job. Um, so. My question really is, are we just going to accept, okay, adjunctification, sorry if you're offended by that term, is that the future now? Are we going to just accept that as part of the HA or the OA or the Academy? Is that what we're just going to say, yeah, okay, it's what it is, let's just make that the best, um, the best possible situation for everyone? Or are we going to continue to fight and say, no, we do need more tenure track jobs? Then, of course, as Charlie was pointing out, the political climate is not favorable to that. So um, this is just one of these horrible, <laughs> typical situations where um, I don't, I certainly don't even know what the solution is really, to be honest, but it's just something I've observed. Um, uh, uh, yes? yes? I have many things I'd like to say, but let me confine myself to just a couple of points. Uh, the first one is you mentioned that there have been three downturns in your career. And yeah. it's come back. Yes, it has. But in every single case, it's come back at a lesser level. Yeah. And I think that's important to understand. That's true. Um, secondly, uh, there are right now, including our cameraman, 14 people in this room, uh, two left. Is there a single member of the AHA leadership? Is there a single member of the council? Is there anybody who is associated with uh, law, larger issues uh, other than the members of the panel who are representing the AHA in this? I would suggest to you that the failure of any group of people to be here suggests that it's a much more dire situation than you might think because of the apathy of the profession. I, I, I hate to be serious, but I am in um, This is one of the most serious issues of our profession. And where is everybody? We care about adjunctification of the academy, but they're not here. Well, we're here, but I walked out to the to see who was standing outside. There's more people standing around that talking outside than there are here. And I speak as someone who's a public historian who's never been at a university since I finished my PhD. Well, the AJ this does come from the AJ Council. No, no I understand from that. the teaching council, and there have been two other sessions on this issue at this conference, uh, one of which uh, Donald's had about 15, 17, 17, 17 uh, at, at that one yesterday. Okay. And to, to make a point, I think you raised a really good point about the role of the leadership, and I think this is, as a model, I mean, uh, the Organization of American Historians leadership uh, is very engaged in this issue. Yeah. And in fact, in yesterday's session here at the AHA, there was a member of the wage uh, executive board uh, in the audience. So, you know, so, uh, so and I, I agree with you, and it would help. It would be helpful. If, if members of the AHA council or the, the AHA president you know, were visibly uh, more involved. I did have another suggestion. I don't want to cut off anyone else, but I did want a chance at some point. Well, oh, go ahead. You want to speak to the issue of the status quo? Or go ahead. Um, 
And that is uh, one thing that we've struggled at with the organization of American historians is uh, how many members of the OAH are adjuncts. I don't know if you've, you've, you've done a survey of the AHA membership, how many, how many are adjuncts? And I bet you it's very few. And that, that may be a reason why there aren't many in the audience. And we've gone through this ourselves. You know, we, when there's, we, we began attracting very small audiences. And we wonder why, and maybe it's because there are a few members. And so one of the things that we're wrestling with at the OAH is how is it that we can make membership in a professional society more available and more attractive to adjunct members of the, of the profession who, first off, struggle to pay the membership fee in the organization, and more importantly, struggle to pay the fee to go to the professional conference. I mean, what's, what's the registration? So, what, $160 registration? A hotel is, uh, the, the Hilton is $180. That, that's a lot of money. If you don't have travel money, uh, it's not affordable. And uh, we at the OAH are basically trying to, how do we address this? You know, to basically open the doors so that not only do can uh, contingent faculty be uh, fuller members of the department, but they also could be fuller members of, the, of their academic community and participate in the professional meetings. And that would be a strong uh, suggestion I would make to you, and that's something we're, we're pushing in the OEH. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, if I may, you know, the apathy of the profession is critical. And this isn't just in, in uh, the, the question of adjunctification. Uh, you, you know, I talked a lot about community colleges. Um, again, there's a, a huge number of historians that teach in community colleges. For 25 years, I've been trying to get community college departments to become more active in the AHA and to list. I think we have two or three that are currently listed in the directory. Most people who are community college historians, not just adjuncts, but even tenured people, don't even belong. There's still, I mean, that's a very individualistic society. And history is a very individualistic profession. And I think too many people simply think that they're going to deal with this on their own terms. And they're going to somehow become as lucky as Dr. Kim was. Not that she doesn't deserve her job, but I agree, there's a lot of luck involved in getting a tenure track job today because there are an awful lot of good people that deserve them. And uh, we're still dealing with this too, too far individualistically. That's why I suggest that I think the only solution to this is a broad political movement. It's nothing the EHA can do, not, not on its own. You know, our charge was what the AHA could do, and you've heard some ideas today are, that are not things that the AHA would do, but that we, we are still interested in, and including uh, unions, and um, including collaborations, which is what the AHA will do with other institutions. Um, thank you guys very much. They may, may have just been 10, but it's a mighty 10. <laughs> and uh, we're very appreciative that, that you came. And uh, I hope you'll take a look at the full report when it's published. And contact us and the AHA if you have criticisms or suggestions, because hopefully this isn't the end of it. Actually, this is at least the third AHA official report on adjuncts. And we'd like to make it so actually something happens and that we can make some change in the culture. And uh, we can only do it with your help. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.